In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Jesus' ways are not your ways, nor are his thoughts your thoughts. We saw this today. He seems to go out of his way to put himself in the worst situations. He doesn't avoid the awkward, maybe the children's questions. He doesn't shy away from the uncomfortable, eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners. He doesn't hide from the disgusting. He puts his own life at risk, even lays down his life that others may live. Now seeing a village of lepers, you would take the long way around. You'd circle back, take the detour, or just find another way. Because leprosy is gross. They're sick with a disgusting disease. And to even come near them is to risk getting the disease, but even worse, making oneself ritually unclean. Now, yes, today, leprosy is easily cured by modern medicine in any first world country. So you're not likely to know any kind of leper until, unless you go to a third world. But that doesn't mean that you don't have your own lepers. You have that person or people whom you just don't feel comfortable around. Normally, I'd say use your imagination, but now with COVID-19, it's really not that hard <laughs> to imagine six feet apart and isolated already. Who is the person you won't sit next to? Who is the one that you move away from in the grocery store aisle? And what does it take? Probably just a cough or a sneeze, a little sniffle, or just seeing someone who doesn't have quite, hasn't quite donned the correct apparel or in the right way. This doesn't just apply, of course, to now with COVID craziness. You got to think bigger. In the church, who are those people whom you won't talk to? Who are the ones who you think it's safe not to come near? Maybe their leprosy of a sort will wear off on you, and you too will get their sickness. Now, maybe you feel completely justified in isolating and separating yourself from others in times of plague, but what about the rest of the time? Isolating yourselves from others, because you're just not comfortable with them. That's an unnecessary, ungodly, and really a sick quarantine. There's really no one in the Christian church, and really outside the Christian church, whom you need fear. We don't need to fear the sick, the poor, or the dying. Just the same, there's no ethnicity, no lifestyle, no background that prevents real and intimate contact from you. Christian. And there is no time in the entire history of the Christian church where Christians intentionally and uniformly fled from those who they didn't like, or worse yet, were sick and dying. Especially withholding for a time the Lord's word and the sacrament of his body and blood from the dying world. It is our sacred duty and vocation as Christians and indeed as preachers to give God's word and to deliver his gifts at all times and in all seasons. Baptizing, giving his body and blood to eat and to drink. Yes, even gathering together as Christians as the world around us is dying. This is nothing new, but we maybe have forgotten. Martin Luther, of blessed memory, in 1527, was living in the midst of a severe outbreak of the plague. And his fellow Germans asked him to give an opinion what to do. What do we do? And so he wrote an instruction or a letter to the evangelical churches of how to respond in times of deadly disease. I won't read you the whole thing. It's about six pages in English, so. <laughs> but his conclusion was this. He wrote, in times of plague, first one must admonish the people to attend church and listen to the sermon so that they learn through God's word how to live and they learn how to die. Second, everyone should prepare in time to, and get ready for death 
by going to confession and taking the sacrament every week or even fortnight. And third, if someone wants the pastor to come, let the sick person send word in time to call him and let him do so early enough while he's still in right mind before the illness overwhelms the patient. Three things that we didn't do for about five months due to a plague. Now you might object because Luther, of course, was living in medieval time in a backwater part of Germany and he lacked today's medicine and therapy. Except that would mean then our response <laughs> could be even less isolationist. In the same work though, earlier, he goes to great length to encourage his German people to use medicines, to take safety measures. He advocated actually quarantining the sick. And if possible, if you could leave without forsaking the vocations God had given you to do so. But of course, he directed both the princes and the rulers, the pastors and all medical authorities to stay for the sake of caring for those in need. He wrote, as we have learned, all of us have the responsibility of warding off this poison to the best of our ability because God has commanded us to care for the body, to protect and nurse it so that we are not exposed needlessly. Yet in an emergency, however, we must be bold enough to risk our health if that is necessary. Thus, we should be ready for both, to live and to die according to God's will. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself, as St. Paul says in Romans 15. Now, Luther is not saying anything new. This is the same approach that had been taken throughout antiquity. And it's really continued amongst Christians until quite recently. It was the Christians who set up the hospitals of the ancient world and into modern era. Even recently, some of you maybe remember, Christian churches setting, set up specifically to care for those with tuberculosis and polio. They used what they knew of the disease. They took suitable precautions. They cared for the physical need of their neighbor. But the agenda wasn't that alone. Most importantly, they never ceased to deliver Christ's word and his gifts. And they never ceased to gather together. Even in some places, like in these TB hospitals, they would gather together and worship each together in quarantine. Now, for all of this, no doubt, Christians have taken their cue from Jesus, the Jesus we met today in the gospel. You notice how he set aside his fears. Real earthly fears, but fear it's all the same. He courageously entered into this leprous village. He plunged headlong into their diseased community. He throws away all caution and enters into the corruption of creation. He doesn't avoid the lepers, but he seeks, seeks them to save them. But the lepers are not so sure it's safe to come near him. They are conditioned by millennia of fear and even by God's word given in Leviticus to live in isolation. And so they cry out instead from a distance, Master, have mercy on us. They call Jesus Master because they have heard of him and they believe that he has command over their flesh, over their sickness, command by a word. They ask of him what only such a master could do, to have mercy on their suffering bodies, to heal them. But don't get too close. <laughs> and so when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. You know what it takes for God to give healing? Simply a word from the divine creator, the one who made the heavens and the earth can simply say, you are healed. His word always does what it says. When he says then, you're healed, go to the priest, you're healed, and you go. And rightly heeding the master's word, they went on their way to the priests. This was all established in the law of old, the law given by Moses, that they would present themselves healed to the priests, and then the priests would readmit them into the, Christ, or into the then Jewish community. They're healed, and all is better. 
But you notice that the gospel today took a left turn at this point because there's more. There's more to life than just bodily healing. There's more to life than just living. We learn today that Jesus didn't enter into that most depressed community of lepers just to bring them healing. But he entered into an even darker place. He entered into their sin-sick and death-diseased hearts. Healing of the body is always a wonderful gift, and it is the Christian's duty to pray for those in need, that God, according to his will, grant healing. And maybe if there is healing, it does bring joy and pleasure for a time. But it doesn't take care of the big problem. The ugliest place that Jesus has ever entered isn't a leper colony, it's your own heart. Your heart is more hostile to Jesus than the worst ghetto. It's more infectious than a COVID-19 ICU ward. Your heart is more diseased than a shelter, and there's more death in it than any hospice. Your leprous, sin-sick heart, it needs full and complete restoration, a clean heart, just as it did for all 10 of those lepers even as their body needed. So make no mistake, the healing of the 10 lepers, that was a great miracle. But of course, St. Luke draws our attention to an even greater miracle, and that was the miracle of faith given and received by one Samaritan leper. When he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. Not only had this man received healing for the body, but he had also received a greater healing, that gift of true faith in Jesus. And that's really the point of Jesus' rhetorical question, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Were were they not found, any others to found, excuse me, to give glory to God, except this one, the foreigner? It's not only one that was healed, but it was only one who responded in doxology, that is, with praise and thanksgiving, that Jesus had accomplished this healing for him. Jesus, God in the flesh. Yes, all nine listened to Jesus. They even did what he said to them. They went on their way to show the priests. But one responded in true faith, faith that's lived out in confession, in praise, in thanksgiving. So it began that believing in Jesus is where it starts, with the forgiveness of sins. Seeing him as the savior of all mankind and the greatest healing miracle that anyone can ever receive. That he has mercy on sinful leprosy. And for you, he has mercy on you, that he forgives you. That he enters into the squalor of your life, into the darkest depths of your heart, and he suffers the punishment for your law-breaking. Jesus actually takes all that black darkness onto himself, all that unbelief, so that you would have light and a blessed relief from your doubts. But it wasn't just once. Jesus has entered and continues to enter into every saint, into the lives of every saint. He does it in the way that he's promised. First, he brought you into the full and complete healing when you were washed clean and forgiven fully at the font. In in your baptism, you were saved from doubt and death. Baptism is what gives you new and clean hearts that believe that in Christ's cross, you have the full and complete forgiveness of all sin, that you are healed. And believing in Christ, You have that promise of full and complete restoration, even of your dying bodies in the resurrection of the dead and the life everlasting. But not just that. The word of Jesus continues to enter into your ears. He continues to call out to you because you still, as long as you are in this flesh, need healing desperately. So by the voice of Jesus, you are given a spirit of faith 
that responds with thankfulness and praise, daily returning to, your font, to the font and weekly to his altar. And in returning to Jesus, he heals you as he feeds you with his body and blood. The ancients actually called the Lord's Supper the medicine of immortality. And as you hear in the post-communion blessing, it is given to you for both body and soul, now and forever. This gospel food is rich medicine because it forgives you your sins, creates in you a new heart, and preserves you for this pilgrimage through a valley of a shadow of death. And it will have its way with you. Like the lone leper who returned, you too are here today to give thanks to God that he has heard your prayer, that he still looks out for you, that he's still healing you, showing mercy on you. He has forgiven you, and he daily forgives you not only your sin, but he looks out for your body and life. This is a wonderful gift. And like that one Samaritan leper, we too give our Lord thanks and praise. And thus Jesus has a word for you too today. Just the same. Rise and go your way. Your Jesus has made you well. Thanks be to God in his holy name. Amen. Please stand.